That was very subtle. <clears throat> Good morning. I love how you're enjoying talking with one another. This is good. Good morning. Welcome both here in the sanctuary and also online to the Sunday service of the Unitarian Universalist Church of St. Petersburg. We're currently on the unceded ancestral lands of the Seminole and Tokabaga native people. I'm Ben Atherton Zeman, and I am officially the settled minister here as of last night. For those of you who are new, they don't always clap right there. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> My installation was last night, and thank you to all of you who were there. Um, I am really excited. Today we have an absolutely spectacular worship leader. Sam Obeid uh, will be here uh, to give uh, the main reflection. Um, and we have a guest worship associate this morning. <laughs> Lucinda Zeman. Thank you, Ben. Good morning, everybody. Um, <laughs> if you want a church where books are never banned, where all history is taught in schools, and where modeling a loving, caring relationship, happy 23 years today, Ben. Happy anniversary, honey. I have good news. You may have found your church home. <laughs> Thank you, Lucinda three announcements today. One is please sign up with Chris McDonald. Is Chris here yet? Chris uh, has a sign-up sheet for the uh, UU 101 and UU St. Pete 101 classes, which we used to call the new member classes. Um, they're open to anyone, uh, and especially anyone who is considering membership, but you don't have to be a member. You can just go to the class. Um, and Chris will have that sign-up sheet out there during coffee hour. Our second announcement is from Allison Lonke. If you prefer Pac-Man to cooking, I have good news. The pizza night at the Arcade Mingles fundraiser is tonight from 5.30 to 7.30. Allison and Nora are hosting this event at Unlimited Video Games, which is on the corner of Highway 19 and Haynes Road. No RSVP or quarters required. Talk to Allison Lonke or Michael Rowe after the service for more details, and Ben and I will be there celebrating our anniversary. Allison and Michael, can you wave your hands or something? Okay, there's Michael, and that's Allison. And that's Nora. That's Hi, Nora. Nora. <laughs> Third announcement is from Earl Waters. Earl, can you wave your hand, too? I lost Earl. He's, oh, he's greeting. That's why he's not here. So Earl Waters... And I are very excited to announce this. This is late breaking news. UU St. Peace will be hosting what I believe is the first interdenominational pride service slash celebration. It's going to be right here on Thursday night, uh, June 13th at 6.30 p.m. Please invite your friends and other churches to participate. Yeah, this is good. As Unitarian Universalists, we are a people of diverse beliefs but we share a common faith, a faith that every person is worthy of love and that what we do in this world matters, that we are connected to one another and to the earth. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome here. And if you are new, can you signify by waving? All right, there's some new people waving, thank you. Um, so if you'd like, I'm going to go down and grab a microphone, and then you can decide whether you want to raise your hand and introduce yourselves. I see some of you covering your faces. <laughs> this is not required, but we'd love to hear from you if you are willing.
Nora is especially excited to hear from you. We can sing a song in a second. Anyone? anyone the, the, heart, the first person to go is always the hardest. Huh? Oh. All right. Two at once. Three, four, five. I'm Doc. It's first time to Unitarian Church, but I've been following the concept for many years, and I have a lot of respect, and I see the work you guys do with the homeless. I have a friend named Morgan that volunteers in the back that used to work with me in the underground tunnels of Vegas. I have a charity out there working with the homeless. And so, yeah, and ironically, small world or good energy. I just happened to have meet somebody working with the homeless. She took me on an off day. There was three people back in the room back there, and it happened to be Morgan. What a small world, 2,000 miles away from Vegas. So, and yes, yeah, wow. so I really love what the Unitarian Church represents. I'm glad to be here. Yay, welcome. Well, I'm not sure how to follow that. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm Amanda, and this is my second time here today. Um, so yeah, hi. Hoping to spend a little bit more time here, and I'm really stoked about the mission. And yeah, this is great. So thank welcome. You. Yay. I'm Morgan. My sister here. Uh, I'm visiting her from Tennessee. And uh, unluckily, I live in a very small-minded uh, area of eastern Tennessee, so there, you know, you want, you, you're not going to find anything like this out there. Um, so I'm really happy to be here because, uh, yeah, no doubt, all about the Yay. love. Yay. Different Morgan, by the way. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ashley. Um, I'm originally from Canada, but I've been here for 13 years. I don't know if that makes me Floridian or not. <laughs> um, 14 years in September. Yeah, I've just like, even though I've been here for so long, I've really struggled finding community, like still feeling a lot of like isolations. I try to start a book club and all that stuff, but I'm still just looking. So I, I don't know why I didn't click in my mind to search. Cause I was like, well church, but I'm not, that kind of church, you know what I mean? So I don't know why it took me so long to think of this through, but yeah, um, excited to be here. So, and I'm in well, Wells Park, so not too far away. Um, I do have one question though. Do you guys have restrooms? I've been drinking a lot of coffee. And I just that door and then there are others to the right. Welcome. Welcome. That was awesome. Hi, um, my name is Georgetta and Raj, my friend. We are actually traveling and we were just passing by. We are from Fort Lauderdale area, Eastern Coast. I am originally from Moldova, living in Florida for over 20 years. And uh, my friend is from India, Raj, Rajesh, um, living in the US for over 30 years. Um, we really love St. Petersburg and we were passing by, so we decided to stop by. It's my second time actually in a church like this. And when he asked me what this is, I said it's an open-minded approach to religion. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> so thank you. Yes. So I come from a country where there's so many gods, so many religions, and I've been struggling. I wanted to be part of something where we love everybody yeah. and don't try to be different from others. And nobody says, this is only God. So when you're walking, she said, we have been to a few churches I go to see people, but where I believe in, and she gave me a briefing, I said, let's go. All right, great. Yes. And, and, and we have been here since we love this city. I've been in New York, and again, struggling between a city life and quality. We like it here, we might move, but yeah, I like this church. Whatever I've heard in five minutes, I like it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Good to have you both. Yes. Well, we're glad you're all here. And thank you for sharing. I know that can be hard sometimes. Um, I first like to thank everyone for silencing your cell phones. Um, and regarding masks, if you'd like to wear one, they are available at the front entrance. They're not required, but certainly at comfort level, feel free to do that. 
we're about to greet our neighbors. So remember to ask for consent before giving someone a hug or shaking their hand. And before we do that, let's say some cool phrase like, I'm glad you're here. Look, turn to look at somebody, one, two, three. I am glad you're here, James. Let's have a conversation. You skipped the part. Did I miss a line? You missed your entire paragraph and jumped to mine. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, yeah, when I come off of there, it's hard to... All right. I was like, what's he saying? He's saying my part. I'll just do, I'll just do this afterwards. Do you need to say that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, that's why I got confused. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Sam, who said that? Who said that? Sam. Thank you, thank you. The Unitarian Universalist Church of St. Petersburg welcomes children and their unique energy. You may have seen Nora, but Nora is not our only child. We have a very active religious education program. Our director of religious education, Janae Johnson, and four religious education teachers, they are taking a well-deserved day off today. Uh, so our uh, children will remain with their parents today. skipping right okay. now please rise as you're willing and able for our first hymn number 100 in the gray hymnal I've got peace like a river mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that would be you <laughs> I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul, in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain. Joy like a fountain in my soul. In my soul, I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. In my soul. I've got tears like the raindrops, I've got tears like the raindrops, I've got tears like an apple in my soul. I've got pain like an arrow, I've got pain like an arrow, I've got pain like an arrow in my There's more down the bottom. I've got tears like the raindrops, I've got tears like the raindrops, I've got tears like the raindrops in my soul, in my soul. I've got tears like the raindrops, I've got tears like the raindrops, I've got tears 
like the raindrops in my soul. I've got strength. I've got strength like a mountain. I've got strength like a mountain. I've got strength like a mountain in my soul. In my soul. remain standing for the lighting of our chalice as Millie Jones lights our chalice. I invite you to say our covenant out loud. The words are in your programs online there in the text chat. If you'll follow along with two hand movements, there's a hand to heart, then there's hearts reaching out. Love, Love is the spirit of this church, church and, and service its law. law. This, this is, is our great covenant, covenant to, dwell to dwell together in peace, to, to seek the, the truth in love, love and to help one another. another. You may be seated. Like I said, there's no time for all ages today, so we'll move right to the time in our worship service for joys, <clears throat> sorrows, and concerns. Some children are, in fact, leaving the room. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay, so there is RE by volunteers like Gordia. Thank you. That was our time for all ages, the parade. If you'd like to submit a joy or a sorrow or a concern, um, uh, during the week, just write me or write the worship leader if I'm on vacation. Um, you can also fill out these lovely cards that are in front of you in the pews. So if you write fast, you can do one now. Um, if you're watching the live stream, please put them in the text chat. Oh, I'm going <laughs> From Susan Bernard. Oh, and so who's going to uh, do the, the stones? Oh, I'm sorry. The stones will be done by Johanna Zeman. <laughs> <laughs> As the ripples emanate from the stones, it reminds us that the impact of our lives can ripple throughout our community. So first, let's uh, do a stone from Rob Sanborn. This is a stone of joy. 20 years ago this Thursday, uh, Alan and Rob were married in Elliott Chapel at 25 Beacon Street by my colleague, Reverend Keith Crone. So happy anniversary to you both. If you see them, yes. wish them a happy Another stone from, for Susan from Virginia and Cal Fox, for Susan Bernor and members of our minister search team who discovered Rev Ben three and a half years ago and spent countless hours with the board introducing and encouraging the congregation and Rev Ben to come together. A stone of sorrow and concern for Emma Shock. After 233 days of genocide in Gaza, the occupation ramping up the intensity of their attacks on the displaced in tents in Rafa. Over 35,800 have been martyred, 15,000 over 15,000 being children. What has to happen before we do something? A, jo uh, a stone of concern from Susan Gore for Sid Parnum. A beloved member of UUC has entered hospice care. Okay. Stone of joy and sorrow from Deb Carlson, my daughter slash son-in-law and granddaughters successfully, thank you, <laughs> arrived, <laughs> succinctly arrived in Brussels. No, successfully arrived in Brussels, um, Belgium for the three year, a three year stay. I will miss them greatly. Uh, um, joy and a sorrow um, from John and James. Our joy is that we're headed to the cool mountains of North Carolina. Our sorrow is that we'll miss you all. See you in the fall. That's us sharing in your joy. Want me to? Sure. Uh, a joy from me for several reasons. One, 23 years with this great man, two, my mother-in-law is visiting for a couple of weeks, and three, we're on vacation right after this. <laughs> Let's bring to mind and hold close to our hearts Robin and Alan Sanborn, um, the people in Palestine, in particular in Rafa, um, Deb's family safely in Brussels, and uh, John and James as they head north. Anyone from over there? Sid Parnum. Sid. Um, 
there's a lot of us that are known or, and there's more that are unknown that are facing um, challenges, that are facing health concerns. So let's keep them in our hearts and let's join for our responsive reading, which was written by John Motter. May our hearts not become calloused by the never-ending incidences of oppression and hatred that so many face each day. Rather, Rather may we, we keep, keep our, our hearts open, open to the positive efforts of so many good, causing good trouble in the world. May we have the strength to demand and gain the right for all people to have a safe place to sleep, health care to keep them strong, and the knowledge that their lives matter. The struggle, the struggle is taking longer than it should, but we will get there if we continue to strive for basic human rights. May all of us find a comforting and compassionate presence in the warmth of fellowship and community. And we will place one final stone for those joys, sorrows that remain in our hearts, perhaps too tender to be spoken out loud. Thank you, Lucinda. The mystery is that we are connected even when we feel apart. So let's rejoice in our beloved community that makes of the many one. And let's take about a minute of silence together. Please welcome our choir for our anthem. No, Not our on. choir. Please welcome John Arterton and James Mack. Um, this, this song that we're going to sing is dedicated, it's, it's more about the fact that Ben is our new settled minister than it is about the fact that we're leaving and going to North Carolina this week. Because <laughs> the title is, I've seen the light of a clear blue morning. <laughs> Not because we're leaving. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> It's been a long, dark night, and I've been waiting for the morning. 
It's been a long, hard fight, but I see a brand new day a dawning. I've been looking for the sunshine, but I ain't seen it in so long. That's been all wrong Cause I can see the light of a clear blue morning And I can see the light of a brand new day I can see the light of a clear blue morning Everything's gonna be alright, gonna be okay It's been a long, long time since I've known the taste of freedom and those clinging vines are gone cause I don't need them. I've been like a captured eagle, you know, an eagle's born to fly Now that I have won my freedom Like an eagle, I am eager for the sky Cause I can see the light of a clear blue morning And I can see the light of a brand new I can see the light of a clear blue morning Everything's gonna be alright, gonna be okay Cause I can see the light of a clear blue morning And I can see the light of a brand new day I can see the light of a clear blue morning Everything's gonna be alright, gonna be okay Everything's gonna be alright, gonna be okay I can see the Thank you. Do you ever meet someone and like everything they say is diamonds? Like you just even you're talking about where we're gonna have for lunch and they just say stuff and you're like, whoa, well, let me write that down. Um, <laughs> such a person is my friend Sam Obeid. Uh, she is a poet. I don't have like a, a bio or anything, but I'm just excited that you said yes when I asked you to come here. Sam Obeid. All right, can you all hear me? Yes. Excellent, can you see me? <laughs> you know, when you're sitting down there, you always estimate that the person that is standing in front of this dais is probably six feet, eight inches tall. <clears throat> I'm five feet even, you know? So I was really worried that either I wouldn't be able to reach the mic or y'all wouldn't be able to see me, both of which I think would be a travesty when having a conversation like the one we are about to have. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sam, like Reverend Ben said. Um, I am an anti-discrimination educator, a local activist, and a spoken word poet. He has definitely set the bar all the way up in the stratosphere. I certainly hope that I can do y'all justice with the story that I am about to share. Um, you know, always, pretty much for as long as I can remember, I always spoke off the cuff. Anytime I spoke in public, whether it was a keynote speech, whether it was at city council, 
have you what may. I always spoke straight from the heart, right? But then, as I continued to do activism work progressively, things have always been bad, there's no denying that, but as things progressively just kept getting worse, I found that whenever I got up to a mic, I would completely shut down, my brain would shut off. Y'all ever had that happen to you? Yeah, so I would get up in front of city council for, um, to give public comment or you know the board of county commissioners or whatever, and I would say, my name is Sam and I live at, and that's it, nothing, I wouldn't remember anything else um, because that's what oppression does to you, right? That's, what, that's how dark the world can be sometimes. You shut it out, unfortunately, sometimes at the most meaningful moments. And so today, when, ben, when Reverend Ben asked me to come speak with y'all, you're over there, sorry. When Reverend Ben asked me to come speak with y'all, I decided I wasn't gonna write anything. I know this work like the back of my hand. I'm about to share with you my own life story. Do I really need to write that down unless I'm about to be a New York selling, a New York best time seller author, right, who's getting paid a couple million dollars for it? Why would I write it down? So I'm gonna speak straight from the heart with y'all. I hope you um, will allow that. I hope you will um, be there for me if I stammer and stop. And I hope you will remind me if I lose my train of thought. We got a good agreement going on? Yes, we're okay with that? All right, fan fantastic, fantastic. So um, I'm Indian born and raised. I moved to the United States when I was 23 years old. That was 17 years ago. You can do the math. Um, on my mother's side of the family, I was raised Hindu. On my father's side of the family, I was raised Muslim, and I went to a Christian school. Yeah, it was, it was great as a kid. It was, it was fantastic. No, no lies. As an adult, it's fantastic to have all of those varied perspectives, right? As a child, a little bit more conflicting. You have a lot to deal with. The way that I describe both uh, sides of my family is through the stories that I learned from them, right? How I was taught each of these faith traditions. Um, my school also was like a third family, so how I was taught faith tradition by them as well. My mom's side of the family, my grandmom, did a fantastic job. You've ever had one of those grandparents who tell the best stories on the planet, right? They are animated, they make it, you know, we've got sound effects, it's absolutely fantastic, right? My grandmother did an amazing job of teaching me Hinduism through the lens of storytelling, right? And so I grew up feeling very close to her, of course, um, because it was her faith, but also learning some really good moral values, regardless of whether I intended to follow institutionalized Hinduism or not. I learned a lot of very, very good lessons. Like any family, though, my mother's side of the family is a dysfunctional one, right? My dad's side of the family had a different approach. It was a very uh, hard-handed approach that they took, very, very conservative, hard-handed approach that they took to teaching in that they didn't really believe in teaching as much as they believed in giving orders, right? So it was like very like, this is what you're gonna do, this is how it works, otherwise they're gonna go, totally fine. Thank you for the sound effect. That was great, but I'm pumped, right? So, um, um, or was I? Yes. So with them, it was, it was much more stringent. There was no asking questions. You know the one question children like to ask more than anything else? You got it. Why? I was one of those, I mean, look at me now, right? I was exactly the way that I am now. I was like this when I was a child, but with no boundaries, no understanding of when to ask a question and when not to ask a question. If I had a question, I just asked. I was very comfortable with that. I also got shut down a lot because of that, right? Understandably so. Anyway, so um, on, on my dad's side of the family, I think my dad's side of the family was a little bit more toxic in the manner in which they interacted with each other in the manner in which they raised children. So mom's side of the family, dysfunctional. Dad's side of the family, a little more toxic. And then school was like this, yes, it was a Christian school, but kind of like trying to be secular, you know, like secular ambitious, secular inspiring but starting from a uh, Christian axis, right? Like starting from a Christian center. And so I learned a lot of great Bible stories when I was in school. 
I, um, my mom, my, my family was also, my, my parents were also incredibly secular. They wanted me to learn and follow a faith tradition that I wanted to follow. So they wanted me to have all the information that I could have access to, predominantly my mother. She wanted me to have all of the information that I could have access to before I made a decision which direction I wanted to go. So we would celebrate Christmas. I got um, copious amounts of like picture books and like fun books on Bible stories and so on and so forth. So I learned a lot about Christianity from the time I was incredibly young. And I always loved um, Christian religion, not just because of um, the lessons that they taught, but and this is going to sound so shallow, but also because of the aesthetics, you know? I always felt like the weddings were so beautiful, right? Maybe it's just because I wanted to wear a suit at mine, and my family didn't know that yet, but um, <laughs> the aesthetics were always so beautiful. Everything was nice and crisp. There were always flowers everywhere, right? Wedding or funeral, there were beautiful flowers everywhere, like the saddest moments and the happiest moments still got treated with such honor and beauty and harmony, and I absolutely loved that, you know? And it always seemed like such a kind and gentle religion, not to mention, I mean, Christmas, right? The gifts and the tree and the decorations, right? We have a, even though um, Christianity is a minority religion in India, we have a large population of Christians because our population is fairly large, right? So think about that in terms of numbers. We have a large population of Christians and they really did it up during Christmas. So it was gorgeous. Streets would be lined with all kinds of lights and stars and just decor everywhere. And so beautiful, absolutely so beautiful. I 100% loved learning about Christianity, but I also always thought that when I got married, it would be in a church because it's so beautiful. And when I died, I would like to have a funeral that was in a church because it was so beautiful. Shallow, yeah, but we need some beauty in this world. Come on, right? You, you know, it, it works out at the end of it. It wasn't until I moved to the United States that I realized how much Christians, obviously not everybody, but how much Christians did not like people like me. I didn't know the backstory of Christianity. Sure, we studied it in history, but it was always referenced as a population of people, never um, the ideology that was behind it, right? And so it wasn't until I came to the US that I realized how much Christianity and Christian folks used Christianity to target and hate and hurt people like me. What do I mean when I say people like me? Pop quiz. Person of color, I heard somebody say. Anyone else? Sorry, what? Women, Women. okay, heard. Alternative lifestyle. Alternative lifestyle, all right. Front and center, queers right, the LGBTQ plus community. I did not realize how strongly Christianity was weaponized to harm the LGBTQ plus community until I came to the United States. And when I came to the United States, you know, folks had a lot of questions. What, you were raised in three religions, also you're Indian, you speak such perfect English, it's a question we always get. It's incredibly problematic, we can talk about that over coffee hour. But, you know, Questions like that people would ask, oh my God, you're here to study journalism? You're not an engineer? You're not in medical school? <laughs> okay, what is happening with you? How do your parents feel about this? Folks, get right into it. There is no small conversation that happens, small polite conversation that happens um, when you're willing to be an open book and tell your story, which I'm totally fine with, provided we have some community agreements set, right? And so, um, those are the questions that I would get. What I noticed, however, is that, you know, if we're sitting among a group of people and folks are sharing their life story and what has happened with them, um, when I would share that part of my family was Muslim and they were conservative and so I didn't have a great relationship with them, also the fact that they had a problem that I was gay, folks would automatically and almost instantaneously, that was, there were no questions asked. They would believe it. No problem, right? 
a, if a Christian friend of mine shared how they grew up in a conservative Christian household, there were always follow-up questions. And I didn't understand that. I understand why that was for a really long time, right? There were always follow-up questions. But another thing would also happen. People who were either Christian or not Christian would also immediately come up with the defense of, well, I mean, you understand that not all Christians are like that, right? That's not what Christianity actually teaches. You get that, right? So there would be the immediate defense of Christianity that my, that my Muslim side never experienced. I never got that privilege, right? What I would get, on the other hand, was the casual racism of, oh, you're Muslim, do you speak any terrorist? Right? Or since you're gay, do you still get 40 virgins when you die? Right? Or these random, incredibly, you know, I'm sure we can all agree, right? These, these are some fairly racist comments, right? So these random racist comments, I would get the casual racism side of it while everybody else would get the follow-up and the, you know, the best intentions, right? The best intentions portion of the community agreements. I never got that. And I never understood why until I did, until I grew up a little bit more, got a little bit more invested in the activism community, learned as I went along, and then began to understand this is all, wow, it's all narrative. It's all how we talk about what things actually are and what things actually are not. Imagine the casualty of asking somebody if they speak any terrorist. Right? Imagine how, how casual that has to, for you to use it so casually, imagine how much you do not have to think about it to be able to say it the way that you say it. Right? And so I realized I did not get a lot of best intentions for that. And then most recently, with everything that is happening in Palestine, this is where I begin to make the connection. I've always made the connection. It's no big surprise, right? We've had Islamophobia running through the roots of this country for a very long time now. But you will be amazed at how many connections you don't necessarily make until it hits you in the face or somebody else has experienced it that you are close to that is willing to share with you their story. Right? With everything that is happening in Palestine, I understand now that it is that mentality of you were raised Muslim, of course your Muslim side of the family does not accept you. That is what Islam does. It, does, it characterizes the religion. It does not characterize the people behind it. Right? It characterizes, nobody says, Christi, even, even in speaking to y'all, I was careful to use language of I did not understand how many Christians did not like me as opposed to how much Christianity hated me. I could say that. If that is my lived experience, I am more than welcome to say I did not understand how much Christianity hated me. But the religion doesn't hate me, does it? If you know anything about Christianity, you know the religion does not hate anybody. Right? True of every religion. But that's how we characterize things that we do not understand. Blanket statements about things that we know nothing about, right? This is where narrative comes in. As a storyteller, I see the stories that come out of the different spaces that we occupy. As a storyteller, I see how important that narrative is. As a storyteller, I understand how devastating and revolutionizing words can be. Right? And we see that in everything. When you try to inspire somebody, when you are in a leadership position, as I'm sure you have been, are, will be, when you are in a leadership position and you try to inspire somebody, what do you use? Positivity, stories, through words, right? You use words, right? When you are in a religious space, you use a book to guide you. The book is full of words, yes? Right? When you try to understand or bring together a community, we use words. When you try to admonish somebody, you use words, right? Words are at the core of how we function as a society, which is why narrative is important. If you tell a child, a singular child, that they are not wanted, and you tell that child that same thing every single day for a good portion of their life, they will not only believe that you do not want them, 
but they will believe that not a single one of us wants them either. That is the power of words, right? And so when we share narratives that talk about entire populations or entire faith traditions as being violent and harmful, trust me when I tell you words can start and end a genocide. And that is exactly what is happening in Palestine today, right? It is why, despite the fact that I am Muslim, because I am queer, so many people are able to come up to me and say, why would you support a country that would have you killed? Have you met the United States of America? <laughs> Should I also have my family who does not accept me assassinated because of it? Because they don't accept me? I mean, if that's the case, we can have a very, very queer affirming world if that is how we wanted to see it, right? But that's not the way, that's not how you want to go about it. That's certainly not how I want to go about it, right? And so I think keeping in mind how powerful words and how powerful narrative can be is so much an individual responsibility more than it is an institutional responsibility. And I truly believe that that is what we are missing in so much of what we do. Imagine if every single one of us did a fantastic job of questioning, rewriting, reframing, and rethinking every single thing that we read about social justice, about liberation, about resistance, about religion, about race. Imagine if we did that constantly. Then churches like this could simply be places of community building and nothing else. Right? We wouldn't have to revisit different texts constantly in church because we are revisiting different texts constantly in our own personal lives. We're being critical of everything that we know and being critical of everything that we don't know. Right? And then community building and community care would become so much easier for so much of us. But we don't necessarily always ask those questions. We don't ask. In my humble opinion, I find that as a society, we do not ask any questions. We are happy to have information poured into us without doing any further research. But like I always say, man, Google is free. There is no Google Pro that you need to go to to find extra information. Google is free. There is no Google Pro, y'all, just you know, straight up. It's just Google.com, right? And there's so much information that we can access. For example, if I was to ask this group of humans right here, I'm thinking of a question. If I was to ask y'all right here, what do you know about a country called Afghanistan that doesn't have to do with the war? and that doesn't have to do with the Taliban. Say again? Okay, there's a lot of mamas, right? Because we're kind of thinking through, okay, what do we know about this country? Do you know that in the 1970s, before the rise of the Taliban, Kabul in Afghanistan, just like Paris in France, and Milan in Italy, was one of the elite places one of the elite, I, I saw you mapping that, was one of the elite fashion capitals of the world. Right? I'm so sorry, can you say that again? What? In the Quran? That is not true. No, no. I'm also not a religious scholar, let me make that very clear, right? Um, but I do know that, that is, that's not true because I've definitely read pieces that reference other women um, in the Quran, yeah. Right, so uh, point being, right, back to the fashion capital, point being, we don't know what we don't know, and it's okay not to know things, agreed? Right, but we don't qu when we don't question the things that we think that we know, we might find ourselves making a fool of ourselves someday, right? And if for nothing else, if purely for the purposes of vanity, perhaps, we should use knowledge as power, right? 
So all I'll say to you all is thank you so much for letting me speak off the cuff. Thank you so much, Reverend Ben, for allowing me to speak. All I'll say to you all is words are important. In any way, fashion, or form, words are important. Words can start a genocide. It can end a genocide. It can also begin the process of peace and justice. Keep in mind, again, since words are important, peace and justice. We do not know what those words mean because we have never seen peace and justice for everybody ever. Right? It is a sad thing, but it is a beautiful thing because it allows us the opportunity to imagine it for everyone. Right? We get to imagine it, we get to recreate it, we get to write out what those words look like that describe what peace and justice will be for our world. So careful with your words, but also don't be afraid of them. Thank you. Wow, thank you. We have uh, come to the time in our service in the sanctuary. The offering will now be given and received so that we may take care of our beloved community and our vital mission. What's given in love is received with great joy, and we say thank you. I told you. <laughs> You know what, I, I'm sorry to break from the script, but um, we really should have done something nice for John and James. It is their last Sunday, and they're headed to North Carolina, as they said in their card. Oops. Oh, good, they're staying. They're changing their mind. Now Absolutely. Not, not to mention all the work they helped with that wonderful team for the installation yesterday, and Kermit and Alma, which we watched again this morning. <laughs> yeah. You, we really should have done something special for you. So at the very least, we can lead this hymn. Um, Deb, do you mind coming up? You can, like you and I can lead the hymn. Um, so uh, please turn for your closing hymnal um, in the teal hymnal. We're going to do Blue Boat Home. It's number 1064. Um, you, might, you might see some new words in there, and those are the words that we're going to sing. Please rise as you're willing and able. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. You can do it. John and James are headed northbound, driving over mountains and plains. Far away from you, you St. Pete, but their love, it still remains. They've been singing all their life now, we're the best singers we've ever known. We wish you the 
the best on the roads that you travel and we'll be here when you come home. I sang it with you. I sang it with you. You'll be up in North Carolina, your cute cabin in the wood. We'll lead hymns and sing some anthems, but you're gone so they won't be as good. We'll find singers and play some instruments, asking everyone we've ever known. But it won't be the same when you're in North Carolina, so we can't wait for you to come home. Last verse. <clears throat> Next September you'll you turn to us. We can sing on that special day. You'll come back to lovely Florida. You can help us all to say gay. Blessings, John and James, have a good summer. You're the best singers we've ever known. We wish you the best on the roads that you travel. And we'll be here when you come home. Reverend, Reverend Ben wrote those words. <laughs> Please remain standing for our child's extinguishing. Oh, sorry. Yay. Now we invite you to say our chalice, and our chalice extinguishing as Millie Jones extinguishes our chalice. The words to UUS, UUSP's traditional chalice extinguishing are in your order of service or online in the text check. We extinguish, we extinguish this, this flame, flame, but not the, the light of truth, truth the warmth, warmth of love, of love or the fire of courage. These we carry in our hearts and out into our world. world. You may be seated. Blessings, John and James. Uh, thank you again, Sam, for your words. I, it's an honor to have you here. I really appreciate you being here and the words you had to say. Uh, Sam will be here for the coffee hour, and I encourage all of you to stay for coffee and food and fellowship. But first, we have our postlude. <clears throat> 